Never get too greedy, Franklin. The minute you do that, you lost your advantage. Well, I hope you like mobile games, because if this continues, well, that's where we're headed. Hey everyone, and welcome back to another industry report. So, this is a nice quick little one to start the week off. Our editor is coming back from Canada on Tuesday or Wednesday, so the channel will be back up to full speed then. Okay, why did I do that intro talking about mobile games and, uh, well, those things being more of the norm? Well, it's pretty simple. NBA. What has just happened in NBA is... Honestly, just, it, it's somewhat beggar's belief. I mean, it doesn't really, if you look at what a lot of these companies try to do, and if you indeed look at the mobile space, it does not beggar belief. But in the realms of a full priced, you know, $60, £45 game release, it certainly is wild. So, this is the NBA series, and yes, this is a story that's of massive interest to the PC gaming audience because that's an audience that's super clued into um, business practices and all of that stuff. But I think it's fair to say that the NBA franchise is, uh, you know, maybe not the largest thing in PC and is really a console thing. So it's quite interesting. And this clash of audiences is something that I'm going to cover later on in this video because when you look at the industry and you see maybe NBA and then you see FIFA, a lot of those more, I don't want to say casual, but a lot of those games sort of marketed at a non-typical core gamer audience, they do seem to be trying to pull off a lot more. And then you see what happens with, say, Star Wars Battlefront 2, when the big companies try to move the sort of mechanics and ideas that they playtest in those games, you know, over to the more core games. You kind of see how that doesn't always work out that well. So it does show you that these games are maybe sometimes a bit of a test bet into what the companies want to do. So what's actually happening here? Well, it's pretty darn simple. There's in-game advertising in the new NBA. And it's rather strange because it's not like other examples of in-game advertising. So it's not like Battlefield telling you that you can buy some Battlefield currency to unlock the, um, you know, the previous chapter of war stuff. It's not like Battlefront saying you can buy stuff or a game showing you some skins that you can buy. No, this is completely separate to the game itself. It quite literally is a non-skippable advert for Snowfall, or I think it's Snowfall. It's an FX TV series. It's a TV show inside your video game. What? The whole thing seems a bit weird. Now, it does make a little bit more sense in context, so let's go through that. They have a thing called 2K TV. It's pretty much live action hosted content for the game. I'm assuming it's just to keep the game's audience a little bit more engaged. And essentially, previews of those can be shown in the loading screens of the game, from what I understand, and then you can watch the full episodes of it. Now, that uh, 2K TV thing, that is pretty much in its like off season right now. And seemingly through that same mechanism, we're seeing the these advertisements, in this case for an FX TV show. Now, these are not the sort of thing where it just plays the video while the loading screen happens. No, it is unskippable. So regardless of how fast your loading screen actually goes, you know, whether you have an SSD installed in your console and it goes really quick or something like that, no, it's just flat out unskippable. And that's ridiculous. It is an unskippable advertisement in a full price game. Now, the thing is, NBA already is absurd with its business model. They have had scandal after scandal. I think it was Jim Sterling who at least I saw first cover this um, with the stat system for the players. But suffice to say, the NBA games have absurd monetization. And then we see this, a full in-game advertisement. Now, I suppose what's odd about the in-game advertisements is that it's such a blunt use of it. It's quite literally just is the players who play our game end up looking at the screen for about a minute while the loading screen is there. So it's just them treating that as ad space that they can actually, you know, put, uh, you know, they can put ads on, right? So basically that's ad space. That's something they see as, you know, inventory, right? And they need to, you know, fulfill it. So within the traditional sort of way that you see the advertising model, that does make a lot of sense. Now, the thing is, it's actually not that integrated really into the game's mechanics and rewards. And that's really where these in-game advertisements could get a lot worse. So, you know the way maybe when you were younger, and I think a lot of people still do this for V-Bucks, um, sort of that audience are more into doing this sort of thing, where you can do surveys for pennies. 
right? Or you know, something like that. Well, a lot of mobile games have really taken that on as an idea. So in a lot of mobile games, the game itself will be free to play, but if you want some premium currency, there'll essentially, there will be a bounty board of advertisements you can watch, or maybe some surveys that you can do, which will get you some free in-game currency. Of course, it's not really free. You're giving up your time and your data in a way that generally is extremely inefficient. Uh, you know, you could probably work at half of minimum wage and uh, do a lot better. So that is an example of the actual game's currency reward loop being integrated into the in-game advertisement mechanic. Now that's one way that those games will do that, right? So for in-game currency. There are of course games where, you know, you can play the game for five or six tries, and then they'll just show you a video ad, and then you can continue to play the game. Now, I'm generally a little bit more okay with that in the mobile context, because the game literally is free, and, you know, maybe they'll charge you 99 pence to remove adverts or something like that. That, to me, is basically fair enough, but it's when you get that integration with game mechanics that there really is a large problem. Have we seen this in NBA? No, but NBA still, I think, does violate just being reasonable in that it is a full-price game that has... These, um, that has these advertisements in it, which is absolutely ridiculous. Now, as I've alluded to, it's the integration of those advertisements to game mechanics that's the real danger territory. So take that Battlefield currency. Imagine if you could watch a, an advertisement in Battlefield and then get some Battlefield currency. Now, why do I say that I don't really see this happening for a lot of the sort of current in vogue core games? Well, basically because right now, it's so transparently ridiculous and unreasonable that the audience would not buy it and the companies know they would not buy it. But the thing is, a lot of the things that are completely normal to us now were not reasonable six to eight years ago. So while I say to myself, I look at Battlefield 5, which, you know, now that it's got some updates, is actually a game that I've been enjoying quite a bit. Well, I look at that game and I'm like, um, could I see those things in this game? No, no, it just wouldn't fit. I just couldn't see a way that it would fit. But, you know, you look at what's happened in the past and you think maybe to five or six or seven years in the future, and you're like, well, you know what, as little, as, as much as I don't see that fitting now, that could actually be a thing in the future. Now, being real with you, I don't think it's going to hit those core games as much, but for some of the more sort of casual social games, like, say, The Sims, I could totally see something like this eventually making its way into a game like that, or being more common within free-to-play games. And, of course, we have seen other examples of this. There was a version of um, Street Fighter where you would essentially fight with characters who had advertisement costumes which was pretty darn wild and bizarre. Now, if that's a free-to-play version of the game and, you know, the price that you pay is you have a few ads in your characters, I actually don't mind that too much. It's when things start to be unreasonable, when you have it mixed in with a $60 price point or mixed into the in-game currency mechanics, that's where I really have an issue. Now, let's get on to, I think, the more important topic, which is the division of audiences. All the companies will have their audiences in their heads fairly well divided into, like, different groups, right? So, if you take the FIFA audience and the Battlefield 5 audience, guess what? They tend to be fairly different. And the same goes with, say, the NBA games. Now, a lot of those sports games are not really, they're not really appealing to the super hardcore gamers, right? The core gamers, the people who I'd say are watching a channel like this. Indeed, I think most of the people who click in this video, they're not clicking on it, being real with ourselves. You know, people are not clicking this video because they care about NBA and play that game all the time. Most people aren't they're probably going to be clicking on it because they're worried about business trends and how they can affect games. So the thing is, because the NBA audience and the FIFA audience are less clued into these issues and seemingly just care a little bit less, more likely just because gaming is probably a smaller part of their overall, I guess, free time, they tend to be a bit more, you know, accepting of things. Now, FIFA Ultimate Team, it's ridiculous. It's pay to win. It is tweaked stat profiles, right? It's like, if you were to apply a direct Hearthstone example, it would be like having Hearthstone cards of slightly, you know, varying effectivenesses, uh, versions of the same card, like you just get a, a golden fireball that was a little bit better. It, now, there are other mechanics there, but it's kind of like that, where it's not just the diversification of your deck, but it's also the quality of each card. And when I say card, I mean player. It's a ridiculous, ridiculous system that would not be accepted by core gamers in core games, yet they try to smuggle something sort of similar-ish to that into Star Wars Battlefront 2. Of course, knowing that Star Wars Battlefront 2, well, 
you know, they had John Boyega in the trailers, um, you know, in the marketing materials for that game. They know that because it's Star Wars, it's got that pretty broad casual reach. And you can sort of see they tried to inch their way into a slightly more core game with a monetization model like that, which, you know, not very good. It did not go down that well, and that game pretty much ended up nosediving at launch because of the massive problems that that caused for them. And rightly so, but the point still stands. You constantly see different evolutions of different bases models aimed at different audiences. So right now, for the core gamers, what are they doing? Well, it seems like it's all about the subscriptions and the live services to keep you in those subscriptions, and then with optional cosmetics and things like that. We are seeing that for the core gaming audiences, the loot boxes, at least in with, with some publishers, are a little bit less in favor. However, as soon as you move away from that core audience, yeah, loot boxes are in. Seemingly for NBA, in-game advertisements for television shows, they are in. And then you look at mobile and what the mobile audiences will accept. And then there's a whole bunch of mechanics that exist for mobile that we slowly sort of seem uh, see to be like feeding their way back into our core games. So overall, what can we learn from this division of audiences? Well, pretty much it's just business analytics. Different audiences, different groups of people will accept different things. And even if I look at, say, my Twitter analytics and the advertising profile of my followers, it breaks them down in very similar ways. So from the minds of any sane business analytics department who of course have their own set of numbers that they're trying to improve, well, that's just how it's going to go. You're going to get the most effective business model for the core people, the most effective for mobile, and the most effective for the sports and casual games. Now, what are the impacts of that? Well, it essentially incentivizes broadening the net of gaming to include as many potential sort of user segments as is possible, and then working out what things monetize best with those audience segments. Gaming revenues really did increase when they worked out how to properly do that for mobile, and then also how to do that in a far more deep fashion for the likes of FIFA, with Ultimate Team being a massive, massive part of EA's bottom line. Now, I suppose the only worry from my perspective is that this would make the part of games that I care about the most, core games, a little bit less attractive because if you can just show these advertisements to um, you know to the NBA players and do all the stuff with the character stats and do your ultimate team and all your mobile games it does make you wonder if a just reasonable game for a reasonable price is going to be as in vogue of a thing and if you look at say the likes of EA what do you see more of well live services and stuff like that. You see more plays towards subscription services across many different publishers, which, as I've said, seems to be a part of what they want for the core audiences with monetization. So how is that going to go? Well, we're going to have the live services that win and the live services that fail. Battlefield Five, oddly enough, seems to be turning in a better direction. And you look at, say, The Division 2, by all accounts, a pretty darn successful live service. And as much as maybe Fortnite is, uh, you know, not, uh, well, it's a bit of a divisive game sometimes, it's another example of a pretty successful live service that, from what I understand, like, all of those games really are ones that, mechanically speaking, are very fair and do give their players quite a lot of content. Of course, you've got the other side of the coin with the likes of Anthem, which is a lot more of a problem. So we're going to be seeing that kind of winners and losers with live services. And I wonder if an element of that business model will just be, you know, to try to put out an MVP, see how it does and then work out, you know, do we stick with this? Or do we abandon this? I'm a little bit worried that'll start to happen. But yeah, it seems like for that segment of gaming, it's going to be the live serviceification of things like we even see with Assassin's Creed these days and then indies. And um, if those live services end up being really good, then there are some genres of games, like maybe Battlefield, like, say, Rainbow Six Siege, where that can work out to be a pretty good game. However, it is obviously not really that good for a lot of other game genres, ones that were pretty big in the past. So there is just a bit of a worry that the business models of the industry will begin to shift the games that actually get made. And all of this is driven by the segmentation of the different gaming audiences and working out what business models work for those audiences. At least that's my take on it. That is my view of things from where I'm sitting anyway. I'd love to hear what you think about all of this. And I guess going back to the actual original topic that sparked off this whole discussion, what do you think about the whole NBA situation? So let me know down below. There will be more content on this channel very soon. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.